I think we've got everybody, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you all for joining. Um, Mike, thank you for making time for us this evening. Sure. I don't think we've got any other folks. I uh, see Chris Cutter uh, join in. So um, I'll ask Chris uh, if there's anything you want to add as a member of the public. <laughs> Um, to weigh in here, uh, feel free to. Otherwise, uh, just uh, enjoy the show. Um, so our first item on the agenda is our annual uh, Freedom of Access Act training, which is why Mike's here with us tonight. Um, so every year um, we have to, uh, um, as part of our town council rules and, and code of uh, conduct and all that kind of stuff, go through an annual refresher on this. Um, uh, particularly relevant and beneficial for the two new counselors, um, but something that all of us should be, um, you know, well aware of and putting into practice on a regular basis. So um, Deb uh, is our um, Freedom of Access um, uh, liaison. Uh, is that right title, Deb, or coordinator or main point of contact, I guess. So any, any Officer, requests? Yes. Officer, yeah, okay. So any any requests that do come in, um, funnel through her. So um, I'm sure we'll go through that in detail. But uh, Deb is a wealth of knowledge on this as well, from having um, handled this responsibility for a number of years now, as well as um, been involved uh, in many regional and state level trainings um, and workshops uh, and things like that. Um, to to stay on top of the latest and greatest in this area. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to both Mike and Deb um, to run this part of uh, of our agenda. Um, please feel free to ask questions and and um, uh, participate as they go through the stuff. Deb, do you want me to lead off? Yeah, Mike, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, we circulated. Um, our memo, which really didn't change much from last year. Um, I'm going to start at the end of the memo because that's um, where it talks about COVID-19 and which allows this workshop to be done remotely um, is a combination of state statute and the governor's executive order declaring a state of emergency. So it, we're authorized to have uh, virtual meetings because of the declared state of emergency. Once the state of emergency um, is, uh, has expired, that section is automatically repealed and we will go back to uh, in-person meetings. And who knows whether the legislature is gonna take up something to make this more uh, you know, of an option going forward. It, it's certainly helpful uh, you know, if we if this were uh, snowing really hard tonight, we might opt out of a in person meeting and have a virtual meeting. But we'll see what happens uh, after this is over. But it certainly has made it convenient for me if I have a meeting in another town that's hours away. I, I don't have to drive home late at night, so I kind of like them. Mike and and Deb and Matt, just on that point, are are you guys? You know, hearing anything, I, I know it's it's not a front burner issue from the standpoint of you know dealing with more pressing matters relating to the current um, you know state of emergency. But uh, are you hearing any anybody raising that as a as a you know likely path that we might go down uh, yes, in I, some form or another? I, I uh, uh, that's a great question, Jamie. Thank you. Uh, yesterday on my uh, uh, Southern Maine uh, managers meeting. Uh, Kate Dufour and Steve Gover there from MMA, and I believe they'll be bringing a bill forward in this, uh, or at least there be, will be at least one, if not multiple bills being brought forward to to have this as uh, as an option going forward in the future. Uh, so they'll be, they are pursuing that as a legislative approach. Uh, they're also looking to get the governor to make sure she uh, uh, submits another executive order close to the end of the year because that her current order expires, I think the 27th of December. So uh, we're waiting to have that uh, from, from Governor Mills as well. So uh, in the short term, we're looking at an expansion, but I think in the long term, they're looking to have this as a permanent option because uh, 
I think across the state, they found that people have had uh, a higher level of participation uh, from the public and the ability to, to tune in and not having the uh, obstacle of having to physically go to uh, go to a building to, to see what their public officials are doing. So it's, I think it's been fairly warmly embraced uh, as long as people have been successfully uh, getting it out there where folks can all have access. Okay. Thanks. I, I talked to GP Cog last week and they were also working in the region to have something together to show support for remote meetings continuing in some fashion. Great. <clears throat> well, so I want to talk a little bit about, um, uh, you know, public proceedings and public records and Deb can, Debbie can jump in at any time on, on Either, either point, she, she should be the one that's delivering this uh, because she knows so much about it. Um, but uh, all of the same requirements for public notice uh, and uh, public participation apply to any virtual meeting as well as they would have for an in-person meeting. Um, so you have to keep that in mind. Um, I don't really want to read through the memo, but I would like uh, and would really encourage questions. But um, so feel free to interrupt at any time if you have any questions. I would also, I guess, reference you to the code of ethics for the town council. I'm sure you've read that already. But one of the things we're going to be talking about is email communications and how those are um, public records and available to um, uh, be reviewed uh, upon request. So you're supposed to keep um, record uh, copies of any emails electronically um, through the town on anything that has to do with public business. And those, those emails are discoverable, if you will. Um, so you wanna make sure you don't put anything in an email that you wouldn't wanna see in the Cape Courier, basically. Um, so we recently had a case uh, in another town and got a hold of emails from a code enforcement officer. It had to do with the zoning board issue and stuff. And some of the emails were uh, really uh, critical. I mean, like smoking guns uh, that he was saying how he, he felt like he had made a mistake that the other side had uh, really good points on X, Y, and Z. And, so it's just, it was, you know, just a reminder that those things are uh, available for inspection by the public. Um, I'll talk a little bit about public proceedings. So this, uh, you know, the council is a uh, body that has more than three members. So any uh, anytime there's a meeting, even if there's just two people meeting, um, of the of the council, uh, it has to be notice, and uh, people have the have to have the opportunity to observe what's going on. And so, just want to remember that that if you're if you happen to run into each other and you're talking about something that's before the council, <clears throat> uh, that's really you sh you shouldn't be and. And it, if you if you find yourself having gotten into that situation, then at the next meeting you should disclose that and that you talked about it, but no decisions were made, that type of thing. So that it, I mean, the main purpose of all of this is that the uh, legislature and the courts want um, the public's business done in public and do not want uh, you know clandestine meetings, uh, secretive meetings where things get discussed that are before the council. So, I mean, it's okay to talk about when the next meeting is or that kind of thing, um, but no, no pending matters, no public business. So, you know, I don't know that if there are any questions on on that aspect of of having um, everything be out in the open and the public policy behind that. Um, 
Go ahead, yes. Catherine. Uh, I just have a quick question about the email. Should we keep, every, I mean, when Debbie sends me an email saying what time are you available for a meeting, can I delete that or should we just keep absolutely everything? Well, I guess I would err on the side of keeping everything, but really some of the, yeah. if it's just availability uh, for a meeting, I, it's hard to imagine that that's really gonna be critical uh, okay. down, the, down the line. Deb, do you have a comment on that? Well, I, I agree with you, Mike. I think that, um, you know, like you say, you err on the side of caution, but certainly setting up a meeting, um, you know, is within, you know, the rights of the council members to talk and, and for staff to talk with council as well. Um, one thing that we've talked about over time, you know, particularly with emails is to maybe set up folders in your emails for council business or what have you. Um, we all know that, you know, if and when we have to produce emails and so forth, it's like, you know, how do you go through, where do you even start to find emails and depending on the search engine that you have and so forth. So that might be a tip um, for people just to, you know, try to keep the folders, but certainly setting up a meeting, um, you know, doesn't necessarily have to be kept. Um, you know, we talk about maybe getting in the habit of keeping everything just so you have it um, and then you're safe, you know, no matter what. Um, and I think just what I would like to uh, mention too, Mike, is that everything that applies to the council applies to our boards and committees as well. So their meetings are public, their emails, text messages, the notes that you take, you might have a yellow pad of paper like I do. Um, all those, uh, it, they are public too. And again, this extends to our boards and committees as well because they represent the town and the business that they do on behalf of the town, so. Yeah, and that's a great point, Deb, because you know, when you, if you ever go into an executive session and you bring that yellow notepad and you take notes, those notes then become public records that would be um, discoverable. So we don't recommend taking any notes in executive session. Um, and, and you're not allowed to take a vote during executive session. You can discuss, <clears throat> for example, rights and responsibilities of, of the council with, with the town attorney, but you can't make a decision. And then you go back out into public and then have a discussion and make that decision. Deb, on the email, Matt, you might, I, I, at least on mine, the way it's enabled, I don't think I can actually delete emails. It can, you can archive them, but um, at least when I'm using my iPad, it, it doesn't give me the option to delete them. You can move them yeah, to a I folder, agree. you can archive them. I don't think you can actually, I don't think it actually lets you delete them, so. Yeah, and I guess what I would say about the emails is, too, is a few years ago, um, the town asked of required um, council to have it, the capeelizabeth.org email because that sets on our server as well. So that if we did get a FOA request, um, you know, our technology department would able, be able to sift through the emails as well. Um, so, and I know a lot of towns have gone to that. Some towns have even gone to the length of requiring boards and committee members to have their town emails, town or city emails, so that everything is archived as well. We haven't gone to that step at this point, you know, for various reasons, but um, certainly with councils, school boards, uh, most likely uh, we'll have town and city uh, emails for that, uh, for that reason. Um, you both were talking a minute ago about communication between counselors, um, you know, in-person meetings between counselors and things like that. Can you talk a little bit about um, communication with citizens and constituents and things like that? Sure. Um, if, if, if someone approaches you on a matter that is, is before the council um, and is trying to advocate for a position uh, on something, <clears throat> then you really should try to shy away from those types of engagements and say, you know, we're gonna be having a workshop or our next meeting is on such and such where we'll be taking you up and please uh, feel free to come and express your, your views at that point. Um, because everybody benefits when they 
have that type of uh, exchange of ideas and thoughts. So um, if, if you do um, get approached by someone, the, uh, our recommendation is to disclose that at the next meeting, what you talked about. Um, it, uh, to me, it seems like it happens more <clears throat> you know, for, the, uh, for a zoning board of appeals, for example, when they've got a specific uh, variance request in front of them and they get approached by the applicant and wants to talk to them and they, they can't, that's a quasi judicial uh, position that they're in and they, they cannot have that conversation. A counselor, you know, you're dealing with broader issues of public policy, usually not necessarily a particular um, decision on that that's going to uh, affect that particular person uh, and they may be expressing what their uh, opinions are on a public policy issue um, and that's part of your job as a um, being on a legislative body like the town council uh, is to hear from your constituents so you, you want to engage with them and and have their um, viewpoints but if it if it's something that is particular to them, really need to shy away from that kind of uh, discussion and invite them to the next meeting where that matter might be taken up. Is that helpful? It is. Um, I think the other thing that we've um, encouraged everyone to do, and I think everyone is good in, in practice at, is um, making sure that if you are having those types of conversations, um, to specifically point out that you're expressing your opinion as, as you know, and not necessarily that of the entire council. Um, so even though each of us sits on the, um, the council, um, it can be confusing for, I think, folks in the public sometimes if they hear something from one person to assume that that's either the unanimous or majority view of the entire council. Um, so I know, you know, whenever I'm in that situation, or even if I'm responding in writing to an email or something like that, I often, you know, preface the entire thing by saying, well, you know, speaking from my point of view, but not necessarily on behalf of everybody else. Um, so that's just a good practice to be in as well. Deb, were you going to add something? Yeah, I, I was um, at a training with uh, Brenda Kelty, the ombudsman for the state of Maine. Uh, it was hosted by the city of South Portland. It was in December of the year, probably like three or four years ago now. One of the examples that Brenda used was say you had a constituent that asks to meet individually with each counselor and they try to kind of outside of the public meeting influence and they say, well, I met with Councillor Devereaux and she said this and I met with Councillor Boucher and she said this, what do you think? And so all of a sudden kind of behind or outside, I will say, of a public meeting, um, uh, those influences are happening and people aren't seeing all of them and aren't having the benefit of the same conversation, people hearing the same thing. So that was a really interesting um, point that Brenda brought up. Um, so when we hear you know, that people are contacting counselors individually to meet them on a certain matter, um, you know, I always kind of you know, say to myself, oh, you know, is this one of those instances where unknowingly to people, you know, that all of a sudden outside of the public arena, there's um, kind of decisions and opinions being formed, um, you know, in that situation. So just something to think about. And, and how do people know that on the council that somebody's been d doing that example, Debbie? Well, again, I think it gets back to what you said about, uh, you know, if something particular, you know, is, uh, you know, um, in front of the council at a meeting, you know, disclosing that, um, you know, we'll see emails once in a while that will, you know, be to a certain counselor and say, I'd like to meet with you on this. And then all of a sudden, a series of email follows to each individual counselor um, to meet, you know, and again, it, you know, it's striking that balance with, yes, they, they have a right and they should be talking to, you know, uh, the, the uh, residents and so forth over matters. It's just when um, things start to gel a little bit that they're saying this counselor said this and this said that, this is their opinion, do you agree with them? And all of a sudden you get to a meeting and it seems like everyone's 
you know, already made the decision before they get there. And sometimes, right. you know, it's really hard to detect that or whatever. But like you say, I think it just gets back to disclosing uh, those certain things. I think the other thing that's good to do in practice in those situations is, you know, by and large, many of the folks that reach out to us want to convey their opinion or concern or express, you know, uh, or, or shed light on an issue or something like that. Um, I think whether it's by email or what, by, you know, casual conversation at the IGA or whatever, our job is to listen to that and our job is to hear that and, and not necessarily immediately, you know, respond uh, respond back with, you know, a, a solution to the problem or an answer or an opinion or anything like that. But, and I think most times, you know, when people feel like they've been heard, um, that goes a long way towards, um, you know, uh, at the very least, um, you know, making them feel like somebody's paying attention, somebody's listening um, to the concern that they have. So. Um, you know, different from how we might just, you know, casually talk with friends or family. Um, but, um, you know, just a good, like I said, a good habit to be in as well. Um, I guess I'll move on to uh, public records. Um, and as we had said earlier, Debbie is a uh, designated uh, person at the town to handle the full requests. Um, let's see. Certain things are kept confidential uh, by statute. So those, those records aren't uh, available for uh, uh, response to a full request, medical records and things like that. Um, We also touched on executive sessions when they can be uh, called three fifths um, majority of the um, council could move to go into executive session at, for, for specific reasons. Um, and we've listed off those in the memo, you know, employment issues with some limitations and so forth. So um, does anyone have any questions on going into executive session? I, I'm just, I'm curious, Mike, um, we've had a couple of occasions this year where we've had executive sessions that we've gone into, you know, over Zoom. Um, and I feel like the, the manager's done a great job of trying to separate both the, um, you know, the public part of the meeting from the executive session. We've tried a couple different methods of, you know, either having separate Zoom links or, you know, just making sure that, that um, we schedule the executive session early so that we don't have participants, public participants involved in the executive session. I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on sort of best practices or, or other um, you know matters pertaining to those executive session requirements in this special format that we're in now. Well, um, yeah, I can't speak really to the technology part of it on on. Uh, how you separate people out, but the same things apply that uh, would, in, if you were in person, uh, uh, a motion specifically addressing the uh, matter that you want to discuss in executive session. And then um, if that passes, give Matt time to work his magic on the uh, Zoom rooms and um, and then treat it just like you would a regular um, executive session. Same thing applies in terms of taking taking notes, even though you're at home and you're taking notes, if it's it, during an executive session, those uh, become uh, public records. So uh, you don't wanna take any notes. So we would recommend you don't take any notes during an executive session. And obviously you can't um, poll the group to see which way uh, you're going on a, on a particular item. You can, you can discuss it. And you know, from that, sometimes you can tell what, the way, what way someone's leaning on a matter. Um, but, um, but then you have to go back into the public 
um, area where pe people can view and then have the discussion and, and take whatever decision you, you need to take. I don't know if that was helpful, Jeremy. Okay, all right. And any other questions on executive sessions? Okay. Mike, um, I just had a, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I just had a, like a, a general comment, I guess, about uh, FOA requests. Um, you know, every question that we field in the office, whether it's on the phone or in person, th those are technically FOA requests, right? They're just, you know, we have, we hold public information and we're providing information as people request it. It's interesting that when we have requests and people use the term FOA, they think that they're going to get something different or more because they said, you know, under FOA, I'm, I'm requesting whatever it is. And that's not the case. Um, so um, I just think it's, you know, interesting how some people throw that out thinking, again, they're going to get something different. Um, we at the town have always, um, obviously you take these requests very seriously and, and we've always been of the mind is to as soon as we can to answer the request, get the information to the people and, and so that they have their information. Um, when we get a little more formal is the more in depth requests so that we clearly understand what people are requesting what's the time frame you're asking for what exactly are you requesting um so you know we don't always put people through uh the step of putting things in writing you know tell me what you're looking for okay this is the department they can answer it and you know be done with it um, when it gets a little more involved again to make sure that we are answering the specific questions um, we might ask them to put it in writing or they may supply it in writing. And we also do, uh, as the law allows, we do charge for time um, when it exceeds, you know, the one hour and we charge for copies, of, you know, and, and all that stuff. And, and we are very, um, uh, we treat everyone the same on that. Um, you know, some people, most people don't really like it. You know, when we say, oh, you're going to charge? Well, we just spent three hours of time. We're going to. And um, that sometimes actually um, people then really request exactly what they're looking for and maybe cut down their requests to, well, this is really what I was looking for. I don't need all that other information. So, um, so again, we, you know, we answer for a request just, you know, every day. Um, sometimes it just gets a little more involved and um, uh, takes us longer to respond um, depending on what they're asking. And within that context, we oftentimes can refer them to the website and they can find, you know, we can guide them to where they, it's, it's right there. It's just a question of helping people find where they can get that access. And when you do that, it, it, it takes care of 99 and a half percent of the issues that uh, we get inquiries on if they know that they can find it right there uh, or it's something that we can do fairly quick. But uh, once they realize it and you can help them navigate, uh, it usually uh makes their life and ours <laughs> easier, quite frankly, too. So. Yeah. All right, do you want to spend uh, a little bit of time on, on conflicts of, of interest? Um, the state statute, um, you know, sets out what they consider a uh, conflict of interest, and that's if you have a 10% or greater ownership in uh, an entity that's uh, appearing before uh, the council or has a matter that's before the council. Um, so if, if you have that pecuniary um, conflict of interest, you really need to step down, disclose that, step down and not participate. Um, if, if, you know, virtually, I guess you'd mute and maybe shut off your video or something, but uh, in, if you're in person, you'd actually step down uh, and not be um, with your other counselors um, while that is being deliberated and you can't make any comments on, on that point. So um, I guess also on this, I'd refer you to the code of ethics uh, for the town counselors on you know, accepting gifts um, or um, there's, I believe there's one that if you've accepted a gift of 
over a certain dollar amount, maybe a hundred bucks or something like that um, in the last 12 months. And you, you can't participate in, in a matter that's uh, before the council. Um, so I think it's more difficult sometimes with bias because it's not necessarily a bright line, but you might feel really strongly about a particular for or against a particular thing that's going on um, and that's before the council. And again, this is probably more um, uh, applicable for planning board or zoning board meeting, but it also applies to the, to the council. Um, if you can't make a, dis, a, a judgment uh, on a matter because you're uh, of your bias, that it would uh, affect how you voted on something, then you're, you're, you should disclose that and then uh, perhaps step down. It, in a legislative body like the council, if you're voting on something, it's fine to have strong beliefs on, on, a, on a particular item. I mean, that's why you know, you might have brought the matter because you feel really strongly on it. So I don't mean to suggest that you feel really strongly about um, the solar farm or something like that, that you then you can't uh, participate in, in the discussion or uh, vote on that. Um, but it's, it is something to keep in the back of your mind if it, if it happens to be, um, again, something that's that's dealing more with a particular application for something. Um, so I don't know if anybody has any additional questions on on bias. Um, but really, I, I think that the the memo covers things pretty well, I think. I think going through the code of ethics uh, for the town council is, is helpful. Um, but I'm pretty much done with my talk. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them though. Mike, the only thing I was gonna add to, to punctuate the point on conflict of interest, I, I mean, I think in the past couple of years, certainly I've seen us swing towards almost over disclosing, you know, things that are, uh, which is not a bad thing, um, but it's it's just sort of the, the habit that we've gotten into. So even things that are, you know, highly innocuous and, and you know, pretty inconsequential, um, just so that people are being super transparent about their relationships and, you know, particularly in a small town like this one. Um, and I think that's been a good thing and it, it seems tedious at times and, like it's overkill, but I think it's appreciated uh, by the public, so. Yeah, I think so too. And I think that if you, um, if it comes into your mind that it, is this something I should disclose, then I think you should disclose it. Um, it it can only hurt you later if you, if you didn't. And then people uh, are suspect as to why you didn't talk about it or that that really did affect your decision. So I think it's, uh, uh, it, I'm sure it can be somewhat tedious sometimes, but I, I think it's definitely better to err on that side. Okay. Does anybody have any questions or things that are unclear? Things you wanna add? I'd just like to add, Deborah, uh, when I joined the subcommittee, like seeing the first 20 minutes of this workshop would have been extremely helpful to understand it versus reading it. So as we have people appointed to subcommittees, it'd probably be great to send them a link to, to watch this. Yeah, what we do also is we ask uh, through the staff of each board and committee that their first meeting of the year, which will be coming up for many in January, um, that one of their first um, items is to talk about and review um, these matters as well. So yes, thank you very much. It's always, you know, again, as I said at the beginning, these pertain to board and committees too. And um, so we wanna make sure that um, they have the information as well. So this memo and another memo that I have 
uh, created will be sent on to the staff so they'll have it prepared for uh, their first meetings of the year. Anything else that anybody has? Okay. Well, Mike, thanks very much. Appreciate Great. your time on this as always. Thank you. And uh, enjoy the snowstorm, everybody. Yeah, be safe tomorrow. Yes. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Okay. Um, so next up is uh, our goal planning. And um, so Matt, thanks for sending around um, the document that you did and um, Penny had reached out to me and Nicole as well um, with some thoughts around this. So I'm excited to um, uh, uh, turn things over to them uh, to talk through those things. I, I just wanna, for the benefit of um, Gretchen and Nicole, give a little bit of history and context here. Um, so when I joined the council five years ago, the goals um, were basically an Excel spreadsheet and we'd go around the table when we were in a room together and everybody would just take turns putting things on a laundry list. And it was literally just a line item list of, I wanna do this, I wanna do this, I wanna do this until we ran out of things that people were there to talk about. It wasn't very strategic. It certainly wasn't very um, sort of organized around um, broad themes and pillars and things like that. So we shifted to um, from that approach to more of what you see here today, um, several years ago. And the key pillars have remained pretty much the same, the uh, you know, effective leadership, sustainable community, et cetera, et cetera. The things that have changed on a year to year basis, some of them have and some of them have, are more of those bullet points of, well, how are we actually going to do this? What's the, you know, the, the actual action item that corresponds to living up to this particular goal or, or theme. So um, that's sort of um, how we arrived at, at this particular um, iteration. Um, and Matt's done a good job of in the last couple of years since he's been the manager also, you know, using this to guide and direct um, the activities of staff where it's um, something that, you know, basically they have responsibility for carrying out um, or if there's something that comes up for us to consider, uh, you know, trying to connect it, connect it back to one of the goals is, is why it's something that's come before us. Um, and, and also then similarly, you know, usually at a midpoint in the year and then, you know, towards the end of the year, we'll sort of take measure of, well, what of these things did we accomplish and what did we not and so on and so forth. So, um, so just because that's how it is now doesn't mean that it has to stay that way in perpetuity. I just wanted to give everybody the, the sort of background on that. Um, so you had a little bit of um, context for it. Um, so in particular, Nicole, I know, and I was very interested to see what you put together. Um, I know, you know, from what, what I learned about you, um, you know, when you were running for, for the council, this is, you know, an area of professional um, uh, experience and strength for you. And um, so I don't know, Matt, if you have that and, and wanna share it or give Nicole the control to share that. Um, Cause I think before we get into detail on, on the what, I, I, I would like to introduce what Nicole shared for sort of a format and approach. Cause I think it might be an interesting direction to go in. Sure, I, I can pop that, I can pop that right up now. Okay, thanks. Yeah, you're very welcome. So Nicole, once Matt gets set up, if you want to maybe introduce this and, and yeah. walk us through it a little bit. Yeah, so I've gone through the um, the goal setting under the like recycling committee, and I think that we have everything there, but when you're taking action on something, I feel like something like this could be really helpful to funnel it all down. So basically, I you know, took the goals we have now and 
Um, this is something that comes up a lot. It doesn't surprise me that there was a spreadsheet where it was like a brainstorming session essentially. And so once you get to the brainstorming, then you have to get to the point of like, well, how do we filter all of these ideas? How do we figure out what's the priority and what's not for right now? And so this is like a living, breathing document that will that could change every year or even every six months or whenever it needs to be revisited. But I think the top level is really like, what is the town's focus? What, what do we wanna do? We talk a lot about the vibrant town center, the housing diversity, conserving um, land in town, making the sustainable community. And th those are just examples there that all this, this is just a framework and a process. I wanna stress that I'm not saying this is what it should be or what the, the goals should be here, which is why I intentionally put like one through six for the goal section. But um, basically it's just like, what are the town's focus areas for right now? Now. And so whenever we make any decision, we can go back and say, okay, but is this a decision that um, reflects where, the direction the town wants to be heading? So from there, it, that's kind of like the what the town wants. And then from there, we get into like the town council priorities. And so for us right now, that would be mostly um, probably COVID related things or things that are just going to happen in the next six months to a year. And that's probably some of these opportunities that are identified in the goals that you already have. And then the 21, 2021 to 22 goals is like the things that might take two years or so, like the projects that might get started, like the solar field, you know, actually breaking ground on that. And so this section is really about, okay, what are the priority things that we want to implement and what projects are being worked on to support that the town wants this vision, right? And then the last section at the bottom is like, how do we do that? How do we actually accomplish these things? We accomplish it with effective leadership. So for example, um, if the project were something along the lines of meeting more often or, or having a goal setting process for the subcommittees, right? That's effective leadership, that's engaged citizens. And so that's how we get some of our priorities. If our priority was to get our recycling to 50%, then we do that through, okay, we're gonna oversee the recycling committee. We're gonna make a recycling committee. We're going to um, have citizens on there that will, will do this work. And so this isn't, um, it's just a process to help us funnel, okay, what are, what are, what does the town want? How are we going to do, or what are we going to do? And how are we going to do it? If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Any reaction from folks? Oh, I do. I have a yeah. Go ahead, um, Penny. I I really I I I like the framework because it kind of hits on something that uh, I've uh, asked for a few years, and uh, and that's um, how how we kind of track our progress on these goals. And I think by having the uh, the council. Uh, priorities that what are we focusing on in the in the near term? Um, it forces us to kind of loop back here and say, okay, who's got it and where are we at with it? And so it it, it almost uh, um, uh, creates the opportunity for us as counselors who maybe take a more uh, vested interest in one of these areas to. Uh, really in, ensure that we're we're tracking toward them. I also think that the uh, town focus areas. Um, I think we can look to the comprehensive plan somewhat to kind of fill that piece in. So the other thing I like about this framework is it really uh, forces us to pull the uh, the comprehensive plan a little forward and not have it just. And not have it be this this daunting document sitting on uh, in my bookcase here that I look at every once in a while, um, and so I think what this does is it it takes what we have uh, had in place for the past several years and and really uh, makes it more uh, tactical as well as um, uh, strategic at the same time. So I think it would be a great exercise to be able to get what we have into here somehow. Thanks, Penny. Other thoughts? Jamie, I'll, yeah, I'll go. go if, yeah. Um, yep. So yeah, I, I like this too. I'll say that um, 
I think one of my larger thoughts that I had was probably similar to what um, Penny and Nicole were talking about. But as I read this, my first thought was they're not technically goals because goals should be measurable. They should be um, time bound. So, you know, by September, we're going to do this. Um, they should be actionable. And so I, I love the idea of getting sort of um, what you talked about, Jamie, getting everything down, kind of sitting together. And these are the things we want to work on and getting sort of like a brainstorming sheet together. But then whether it's using what Nicole just presented to us or, or, or something different, taking that the next step to, you know, here are the top things we're going to work on. And this is what it's going to look like. Um, and sometimes you don't know what it'll look like, I'm sure. But um, you know, for some of these, some of these are more actionable than others on here. So it would be nice if we kind of made them all uh, more actionable and then pared it down a little bit so that we have, you know, maybe five or eight things that we're definitively working on in the next year and hope to achieve. And then keeping everything else sort of on the side burner so we don't forget about them. But, um, and I think that what Nicole just showed us is, is a nice way to do that, so. Go ahead, Valerie. Um, I, I agree with everything that um, you've said. I really like the clarity that that gives us. It helps us focus. But I agree um, with what Penny had said, because when we took the um, comprehensive plan, this is what we did, is we put it together and we put, OK, we're going to accomplish this in one year. This is our one to three year. This is our five to 10 year. So it sounds like maybe we're going to integrate that with this plan somehow. So it sounds like that's what Penny was talking about too, because that just makes sense. That way we can look at it and see what we're working on every year. So it sounds like maybe we need to pull that plan out and look at it along with this. What are your thoughts on that, um, Jamie? Yeah, I, mean, I think all of us had the opinion that um, you know, the comprehensive plan does us no good if it's two years worth of work that just doesn't get shelved and nobody pays attention to it. And I think we, as we were going through and creating the different action items from that plan, I remember the, the long process we went through after the plan was written, or as we were, I guess, getting to the end of it to actually break out those recommendations from the plan and turn those into short-term, medium-term, and long-term projects, and, and also trying to counterbalance at the same time the work effort involved in those and, and, and so on and so forth. So I think it makes sense to, you know, connect them together for that purpose, um, you know, again, just so that that work doesn't sort of exist off some, some other place, that it's something that we're, we're continually working against. Um, the thing I liked most about what Nicole put together was, you know, the visual nature of it. I think it's much more digestible and, and easy for folks to relate to and see and understand um, in a way that, I mean, even what we have now is way better than a 60 line spreadsheet like we had before. Um, but I think this continually improves upon it in a way that um, makes it more user friendly, both for us uh, and staff and also for the public if they were looking at it. So um, so I, I think one of the things um, that you know always trips us up here is um, you know things that are priorities that you know we as the council actually don't have a lot of hand in, in carrying out, right? And maybe Matt wants to speak to that a little bit, right? So you know we, we set policy, we set a priority, but we're in, in a lot of cases, not the actual doer, um, you know, like you might have in a, in a business or another organization. So um, I don't know, Matt, maybe it'd be worthwhile to hear from you how, how you use the goal. I described a little bit at the introduction, how you use the goals to work, you know, with the different department and staff in terms of setting your annual plans, but maybe you could talk about that in a little bit more detail. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Chairman Garvin. I'd be happy to. Yeah, we do. Uh, I mean, we do our normal business day in, day out and what we have to do to maintain our, our normal operations. But uh, when we do come forward with, uh, you know, ideas relating to like, like the solar project, for example, uh, looking at that and trying to have that aligned with uh, tie that to council goals or where there are projects that come forward, 
uh, we do try to bring those in line as well as like ordinance changes, things along those lines where we do need to find uh, either solutions, remedies or, or, or progress. We do try to find how we can tie that into council goals, especially from the staff side of it. I love the looks of this. This would be great. I mean, we can even implement this into the budget process as well, I think, where we can say, okay, uh, you know, why are we why are we looking to do this within this department? And we can say we can tie it back to, you know, town council priority two identifies that they'd like to have this accomplished. And this is the goal for the council that they've that they've established. So I think we can come back and link that a little bit. Uh, better. I love the visual nature of it too. <laughs> I really do. I think that that is going to make it easy to use. But but it is everything. I mean, we do our normal business, but the larger items that we do work on uh, that you know may take uh, may take a longer term period. Those are oftentimes the high level uh, desires of the council that we are trying to accomplish, uh, either through uh, individual steps by implementing different projects or uh, or lar longer or, or large terms items uh, such as like the short short term rentals and uh, trying to get that uh, finalized as well. So some of them are longer term, uh, but they are something that may carry over from one year to the next. So, uh, but that is, uh, that's, that's, it really drives a good portion of what we try to do as a, as an operation. And the other thing to mention here is that like mm -hmm. the town focus areas can change, right? So it, it's, I think the comprehensive plan is the voice of the community, right? It's all of the citizens input of what they would like to see in our town. And so that is our focus area because that's what our citizens are telling us they want. And so that's like top of line for them. It's the big blue box at the top. And then from there, it's like, okay, let's interpret what they want into the things that are happening and the opportunities that exist here. And so, yes, Jamie, we wouldn't be able to carry out the priorities, but we can, it could say something like um, balance the commercial and residential needs. And then the goal of that is new short-term rental um, ordinances. And so it's like the priorities are almost what we have now where it's the higher level piece. It's, it's not the specific time bound thing. And the goal goes underneath making sure that that priority might have multiple projects underneath it and that aren't related even. Um, what I really like about this is that we could put it on the website and be like, this is it's almost like a mission, like a strategic mission, more so than like specific goals. There would probably be like multiple extra pages to this, but um, it, it kind of makes it easier to say, oh, we've accomplished number three. We're in the next year. It's like, okay, we're going to replace that one with a different priority. And so you can kind of keep this as a running tally that's just moving things up and like you said, more visually showing it. But I, I saw everything in the sheet that already existed. And I was like, okay, yes, we're doing all of this with effective leadership, great fiscal management, really engaged citizens, an excellent workforce. And then, you know, Penny mentioned uh, regional collaboration. And so there's probably another one there, but it, it just felt like it's, that's what's supporting all of the priority and goal work. Um, I should probably back up just a second to suggest too that um, uh, it's not the intent that at tonight's meeting we get all the goals down and um, walk away with a complete set here. So this will be um, sort of a two-step exercise where um, number one, I'm glad you know we're introducing this idea that Nicole brought to the table in terms of how to reorganize our thinking and, and, and how we present these goals and, and all that kind of stuff. Number two, I want to also get everybody's sort of thoughts and input, and we can sort of, you know, make a running list of uh, what are the things that we want to organize into this new, this new view, this new look. If that's the way we go, which I'm not hearing any opposition to, which is nice. Um, and then at our next uh, opportunity is when we would sort of look at a more drafted version of that that we'd then be um you know making some final um edits and, and finessing too and then and then go forward with that and adopt that at one of our earlier meetings and in, in the beginning of the year um probably the february meeting based on that schedule so in any case i i should have probably uh, detailed that for folks so you don't think that we're going to sit here till 10 o'clock hammering these things out or anything tonight so penny go ahead 
Yeah, I just, uh, I think I understand, um, actually, I do understand exactly what you said. What I, I want to um, um, kind of uh, ask a, uh, a process question, because I, I agree that I think this evening is about um, kind of creating that brainstorm, you know, enhancement to uh, the document which exists today. It's kind of the framework that's guiding uh, people's brainstorming at this point in time. And then um, it would make sense to me that uh, I don't know if somebody or a couple people take the uh, raw materials that we come up with to create kind of a, uh, a straw of a couple of these pages. Um, because once that's done from my perspective, it would start to fall into place because yep. we, we would see those examples. So almost like a, a little subset of people kind of pulling, pulling the raw materials together, getting into this format in order that our next meeting would be uh, extremely productive because we would all kind of start to see the way that this framework can uh, uh, sift through our thinking. So, or we can overlay it. So that is that kind of what you're alluding to? Exactly what I was, so you and I are on the exact same page there, Penny. That's exactly as what I was saying. So, always, always. <laughs> um, and, you know, I'll also say that you know, for the past several years, um, whether it be Valerie last year or myself in the past, I think what you just described has been a responsibility and a task that's fallen singularly on the chairperson. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm more, more than happy to not be the one to do that. Um, partly because I think, you know, I mean, I, I was the one that sort of drafted the current framework. And I think mm -hmm. if, if we're shifting that a little bit, I'd love to see somebody else, um, and whether it's Nicole or Nicole and some other people, um, to sort of maybe take the lead on that um, for continuity of authorship there versus me trying to retrofit, you know, what I had come up with before into some other format and all that kind of stuff. Because I think, and then I'll, I'll also just be perfectly transparent, um, you know, from a timing perspective. Um, it's not something that I, I think I'm going to necessarily have a whole bunch of time to dedicate towards either. So. Um, if somebody else does have that flexibility, um, you know, I would certainly appreciate it. So, um, so I think if we can leave the meeting tonight with clarity on, you know, which one or two or three folks want to want to do that offline work, um, that would be one thing to accomplish. The other thing, which I kind of would like to shift the discussion into now, is you know, surfacing some of the either new things or edits to existing material that's on here um, that people just have for ideas um, that either they, they don't see expressed here and what we have from our, our past year's goals or those either need to be, you know, built out further or augmented in some way, things like that. And Penny, I'm gonna to turn to you to start because, you know, you had shared and drafted um, a few points for folks to consider that I think are all organized around a couple of common themes of mm -hmm. looking, you know, looking beyond just the borders of our town um, mm -hmm. with some things and some, I don't know, maybe you want to take over and, and just talk about, you know, what's okay. on your mind sort of the fed okay. into this, so. Okay, um, um, I, I'll kind of guide people through, and I apologize for my formatting issues, but I was in a wicked hurry, so I forgot to do some page break stuff. So anyway, my apologies. Um, hey, Penny, would it be helpful if I pulled up your uh, your edit that you shot over to the other day? If you want you to, that? I can do that. It'll just take you. Sure. Moment. Do you have the technology? I have. Uh, I have the desire. <laughs> <laughs> so it'll just take. Oh, well, that's one step there. in the right direction. <laughs> okay. While you're playing with technology, I'll get started. Um, I, Basically, um, uh, some of the things that I put in here, I didn't have a home for, so I kind of stuck them out here. But I, as you can see, I started out with the, the question of uh, how we're gonna leverage what we learned through this whole COVID experience. And I think that as we go through and we start uh, looking at opportunities for 2021 
2022 that we're going to, within these some of the near term things that we can do, we should identify those and we, we should take action on them um, and, and not let uh, too much time go by. So I'd put that right up front. Uh, the other thing around sustainable community, what I needed to get in here, and I didn't know exactly how to word it, but I think the framework that uh, Nicole developed is going to help uh, help me and maybe others kind of refine this. And it's that uh, we've got some real challenges in front of us relative to um, um, challenges to what people are experiencing out in Cape Elizabeth as well as outside of our town. And we see it in our surrounding communities. And um, I think I've said this a zillion times and I will keep saying it. Portland carries the burden for our communities and it's time for communities to start stepping up and helping participate in solutions. And I know that um, Jeremy's on the regional coalition, but I, I don't see a lot of action around um, homelessness. I see some action around um, uh, food insecurity. I don't see a lot of action around addressing mental health issues. And I think those are things that we need to start talking about within our town because we have people who access and need access to those services. We might not see them on our streets, but I bet we see them on the streets of Portland. Um, well, Penny, then, if I could what, jump in for a second. I, so I think one of the things that occurred to me as I was reading through some of these similarly themed items here, and I understand what you were just saying and agree, you know, there wasn't necessarily a bucket for what, you know, where they naturally fit. Yep. I actually think that there's probably a need for a, you know, another bucket, uh, you know, how, again, however we wind up actually sort of designing this, <clears throat> but it's focused on um, human services and public welfare. And mm -hmm. I don't, I don't mean welfare in the sense of, you know, uh, a welfare program or anything like that, but people's well-being. Well and I think that, that yeah. brought broadly, um, you know, especially after, um, you know, some of the things um, that we all experienced this past summer, uh, you know, springing into the summer around um, equality and social justice and things like, like those are, those are some of the bigger things that I think would fall into that. Exactly. And, and what you just talked about with, um, you know, some of the, um, you know, regional social welfare issues, um, you know, that are, that are paramount in the community. Um, I think all of that needs to be formulated into a thing um, mm -hmm. rather than trying to, you know, tag it on to these other areas that we already have just for the sake like of that. fitting a you know fitting the puzzle pieces together so yep and, and then i got into that we do need to address the paper streets we got to make that a priority for this year do um, we have to are you sure yes okay yes. No, i'm just kidding yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't want to ever talk about them again. Um, and I, um, <laughs> I'm sorry. And then uh, short-term rentals, we're going to put that one to bed also in uh, 2021. Uh, um, no pun intended. Um, anyway, so, and we we'll know that. Bed for a minimum of seven nights stay and <laughs> yes, 42 exactly. days of rental. Exactly, we got seven days to make it happen. Yeah. Um, so, so those were the things that popped out that those are items that we've been working on that we, we really need to bring to resolution. So uh, um, that to me, I like that framework that Nicole has because those park right in there as near-term things to make happen. Um, the fiscal management, I think, and I, um, I, I think about this as uh, we've got a lot of things on our, our plate. We had to make some big trade-offs in 20, uh, in, in the 2020 budget, in um, 2020, 2021 budget that, um, we got to make sure that we aren't sacrificing um, constantly. We need to figure out a way to uh, to solve 
the many address the many issues that we have in front of us from a, a fiscal perspective um, and and not short continue to shortchange some of the department needs. So um, I didn't know how to get that in there. Um, I think it's being very vigilant about um, the fact that we have a finite number of tax dollars to expend and um, and be cognizant of that. And then um, as we get into, uh, I don't need that one is just kind of an extraneous comment. Um, engaging our citizens, this kind of goes I, back to my point about what were our learnings from the whole COVID world, the fact that we've had so much uh, greater engagement and how we continue to leverage the technologies that allow us to do that. Um, and um, I really think that we need to, and I'm not asking everybody to run a meeting like Penny Jordan does, but we need to, when people show up at meetings, they need to feel as though they're heard and heard more than once. Um, and so it's really um, going back to um, yes, people can speak on things not on the agenda. They can speak up front. They can speak before items. They can speak at the end of the meeting. But some of the, and I've heard it several times, relative to the Conservation Commission, that people aren't um, allowed to engage or they don't feel like they're being heard. And so I just don't know if there's a way that we can create uh, a more, um, uh, a more, more of a dialogue with citizens that show up at meetings versus uh, constraining conversation. Uh, but I talked to Matt about this. It's that that's the way I work. Not everybody likes to work that way. Um, but I think citizens who show up at meetings are asking that. And if we want citizens to engage, then we need to give them the space to do that. So that's what that's kind of all about. Um, and so that also gets into those protocols and what they might be. Um, and then- I, Can I respond to that one for a second, Penny? Sure. <laughs> um, my opinion on it is it's very different whether it's a workshop or a, or, or a business meeting. Um, for a couple of different reasons. Um, number one is um, just from a you know efficiency and time management perspective. Mm -hmm. um, you know, many of our meetings run quite long as it is, and mm -hmm. I, I I I worry a little bit that if we get too indulgent around freewheeling conversation or speak at the beginning of an issue and then speak again at the end of an issue. Um, you know, we're, we're opening up to yep. a real, um, you know, sort of rabbit hole of, of, of never actually, you know, moving business forward. So that's mm -hmm. number one. Um, mm -hmm. Number two is I, I, I don't think that we're in a position, and I think quite the opposite, where when we have abundant means of people providing their opinion to us, whether it be email, whether it be coming to a workshop, whether it be picking up the phone and talking to any one of us, um, and, um, you know, I, I, I don't think it's a situation where, I don't know, if part, part of, part of it for me feels like there's some responsibility on the citizen to not also just wait till the 11th hour and just show up at the last meeting when you're about to vote. If, if it's something mm -hmm. that's, you know, yep. that important. I agree with that. The, la I agree the with last that. thing just sort of functionally too is. I mean, I know that we have our public comment prior to an agenda item for the purpose of hearing, you know, the opinion and the feedback, but then, you know, once we get into our own debate and then actually voting on something, you know, we're not going back on it at that point, right? So I, I don't, I don't know, I don't know how talking about some, you know, giving people a chance to respond publicly following the item I'm not sure what that adds to it. Maybe I, I'm misunderstanding I, your point, but I think I think Jamie that um, the town council does pretty well with um, um, getting um, 
listening to citizens and incorporating their thinking and what and giving people opportunity to speak. It's some of the committees that if if you have citizens that show up at committee meetings, um, whether you know it's Thomas Memorial Library or the Fort Williams or Conservation Commission, if you've got people showing up at those meetings, then they're there because they are interested in uh, participating in that topic. And so, so is that not happening? I, I don't know, Matt or Deb, or I mean, Nicole, you're coming from recently sitting on one of those committees. Is that, uh, Jeremy, I know you're you're going to some of the conservation committee meetings for various purposes. Is that not happening? I'd it, say this is the first committee. It definitely happened. We we very rarely had guests attend, but when they did, it was usually they had some sort of initiative or project they were doing, and we were very collaborative with how can we you know promote that you're doing this event or whatever. So it happened there, but it's also uh, we didn't have many guests. I, I think it, it generally happens uh, when people do come to specific committees. They they uh, they're. Uh, ultimately interested in, in a specific topic that's on the uh, the agenda that evening. And I think uh, what uh, Councillor Jordan's looking for is more of a uh, an interactive dialogue so the person could possibly, and correct me if I'm wrong, Penny, uh, uh, they can respond after they hear what the, what the committee's positions or in, interpretations are, and then perhaps provide uh, input after that. And it's, it's a tough balance because committees, you know, and boards do do need to get their get their work done as well. So uh, it's just it's a it's a fine balance, I guess, is what is what you try. This to is find. making me think of the fact that the recycling committee started a Facebook page, and so people did write in to talk about how they want the swap shop open or um, when we change the bottle. When's the bottle shed open? Yeah. So there was back and forth communications in the comments section there that I think is kind of that. Thing that people are used to now you can state your point and then someone replies and then you come back and reply and you can keep doing that so but yes take, getting business moving forward is a huge time constraint the, the other challenge that comes to mind is thinking about short-term rentals and uh you've been working on that for uh <laughs> it seems like a long time uh but you know as you get closer to the end there are folks who have you know the, there's the point counterpoint and if you have uh, debate at the beginning, then the committee gets to talk about it, and then debate at the end. Uh, the only concern I would have thinking about that is burnout of your committees uh, and terminal terminal meetings. Unfortunately, just and it depends. Hot subjects are hot subjects. So. Well, maybe it's as simple maybe it's as simple as reinforcing with the particular committee that I keep hearing about. I think that's important. Um, the conservation, which is, I mean, that touches people's uh, uh, property. So they don't take right. public comment? I just want so, to make sure I understand the issue. My understanding is that um, people have felt uh, limited in comments. That they, uh, of course, they do the, the three minutes, done, boom onto the meeting. I'm, I'm okay. just saying that there might need to be a reinforcement of ensuring that public is heard at um, at least three points in those meetings because it should be at the beginning and they can be heard again at the end. Well, the thing so I would remind yeah, uh, that's absolutely correct. And before each individual item. Is, is, exactly. I, mean, I, I, I guess I'm not clear why any of the committees would not be using the same exact protocols and procedures that we use, which is talk about anything not on the agenda at the beginning, talk about each individual item as you proceed through the agenda, and then talk about it at the end. Furthermore, I would just emphasize to all of us as counselors and then you know, would hope the message carries forth to any of those committee members too, that if in the course of discussing or debating an item, any of us are more than welcome to call on somebody right. that has spoken or is in the audience to answer questions. Right. Um, you know, we all have that right, uh, you know, as far as the use of our time 
in discussion and debate. So, and, and I, I can point to numerous examples where we've done that, where, hey, can you, can mm -hmm. you clarify for us? Can you help us, you know, can you tell me more about that? I, I'd like to know more. Um, I think that what I, what I don't wanna do is set up a framework and a built-in structure though, where number one, you're creating an opportunity for, you know, single opinions to dominate the discussion. You're creating an endless sort of loop of public input, you know, committee or council debate, more public input. Oh, I guess we better go debate somewhere. I mean, it just becomes never ending at that point. So, mm -hmm. no, I understand. Maybe it's just through the committee um, uh, training that we reinforce. <laughs> okay. And that, that'll be, a, uh, you know, we'll stress that to staff as well, because uh, we do have that, uh, the standardized agenda format and you know, looking at uh, looking at all the different committees work, they have the same format that, you know, is on the council, kind of laying out public participation at each meeting and saying, you know, you do have the ability to speak at the beginning, three minutes and up to 15, depending upon uh, the subject for each agenda item and then the public current opportunity at the end. But uh, what I'll do is I'll restress to staff who do provide uh, support to committees that we need to maintain that operation as our standard, uh, not uh, to deviate from it at all. And I think that's, you know, it's, as we go into the new year and we have new committees, new committee members, it's a good opportunity to hit refresh on that. Okay. okay. Um, Penny, you wanna finish going through here? Yeah. The next thing had to do with an item that even has a date on it, January, 2021, um, that uh, we were to develop to develop a specific plan um, for fire and rescue services, that what's our strategy um, over the next five to seven years. Um, and so that's still on the radar from my perspective um, and should be a tactical or near-term item for 2021-22. Uh, uh, the other thing is, is that I think that we need a um, uh, a strat. We need the strategy, and we need to start implementation around addressing cell coverage and electrical outages in town. I re I I hear it more and more and more about electrical outages, and uh, I don't know if there's a way to put a a plan in place that says over time we will. Uh, attempt to uh, move um, electrical lines from above ground to below ground. I mean, that's a that's probably a 20 year project right there, maybe 30. Um, but the, the cell issue, the technology is moving faster than we uh, can even imagine. And there's no reason why in the town, in our town, we can't have cell coverage um, in all of the neighborhoods. Uh, so I think that needs to be a priority in, um, in this year, and especially seeing um, office buildings are going to become obsolete and home offices are going to become the way of the future, so, or the way of the current. So um, I think that is a, is a key thing that we need to uh, discuss, so. Those are, those are mine off the, and I reviewed, I read all of the, everything that was currently in there. Um, and uh, as Nicole alluded to, they are very broad. And so, yes, they can, they can endure year after year after year. Um, so I think by dismantling this document, it's going to become even more valuable to us. Thank you, Penny, for <coughs> adding all that um, additional thought and uh, bringing those forward. Are there other folks that have anything um, on their minds for things that aren't addressed there um, or are addressed but maybe need to be revisited? Go ahead, Jeremy. Um, thanks, um, Penny and, and Nicole. I think those are all great thoughts and I agree with them, especially I. I would like to see us move, making some more progress on some of the regional coordination around uh, homelessness and social services. I think we were actually getting close to a point where we were maybe gonna have a proposal before COVID happened and we need to go back and 
dig that up and brush it off and bring it back in front and center because I, th I think it's more than time. Um, I, I just had two, I, well, I shouldn't, I shouldn't put just in front of it. I had two sort of big ticket um, projects that I, I don't, I think they're both bigger than what we can pick off this year, but I would like to see us focusing and making progress on. Um, the first is uh, sort of a pet project of mine, which is uh, paying attention to Sawyer Road and, you know, by extension, I think probably also Spurwink. Um, those two crossings, we're going to have to figure out a policy solution at some point for what we want to do with those. Um, and um, I think, I, you know, I, I think they're without action from the council, we're going to just wind up replacing them in kind, which I think would be a mistake. Um, so I, I'd like to put that on our radar screen, but whatever the, the, the chunk we can peel off this year to help moving those projects forward. And the other one is a big project, which um, we knocked, didn't, didn't make it into our capital budget last year, but I think we do need to come back and start making some serious plans with the school board about what the renovation project is going to look like and timing around that. Okay, thanks, Jeremy. Go ahead, Valerie. Um, well, I think, Jeremy, you're gonna be hearing from the school board soon about, about that um, very soon. So that's uh, going to be on our radar at our budget uh, meetings. And when Penny was talking about cell coverage, my understanding is we're working on that, and I think that you're going to find in the very near future what um, uh, Apple and Elon Musk, they're creating a whole network of satellites so that um, our cell coverage is going to change very fast in the very near future. So um, that may be taken care of for us. I think you need towers or something in order to receive the signal from the um, from the satellite. Yeah, I I don't know how many towers we'll need, but it but it's something for us to talk about and figure out mm -hmm. because um, that's going to be changing really fast. One of the mm -hmm. things um, I'm thinking about, and we've talked about this before, is climate change. I think that's something that's very very urgent, very needed. We've all talked about this. I'd really like to see us set some sort of visionary goal. Um, we have achievable goals. What about something that says we'll reduce our carbon footprint by 50% by 2030? Or so it, and that doesn't have to be exactly it, but something that's visionary for us to, to achieve or that we're going to become a zero waste municipality by 2050 or some sort of achievable goal. I know that there were the, um, and Matt and I talked about this, the C40 cities that all adopted the Paris Climate Agreement. And they they basically represent 25% of the population of the, the world. And they're looking at some of these really powerful goals. So I was thinking, It'd be nice for us to think of, think in those terms and set mm -hmm. some sort of a goal where we're going to even just um, waste minimization. You know, hearing about the um, you know Northern Ireland sending their plastics here to Maine and uh, that that's that was kind of shocking to me. I didn't know that that was happening. But what if we reduce our own plastics or we start setting up things and, and talking about how we're part of this bigger community. Um, you know, I know the state has certain regulations, Portland's enacted certain regulations. Um, well, what about us? I, I think that's important for us to do too. I, I'd also like to see us um, talk about the pesticide and herbicide ordinance and really get something like that going. Um, and then that oh. other piece of sustainability and community, I'd really like to see us support um, local agriculture and aquaculture. Oh. Yeah. And I know we support it now, but I'd like to see us 
support it in maybe um, uh, a variety of ways. And I know Penny, you probably have lots of thoughts on that, but it'd be really nice to include farmers, fishers, beekeepers, uh, local gardeners in some sort of um, plan that we have where we're we're supporting that aquaculture and agriculture in our community. And um, I'm sure we have some visionary ideas about how to do that, but it'd be nice to see that as part of our vision statement of what we do here. Not only do we look at um, preserving open space, but we see our historic value of aquaculture and agriculture and supporting that. So, and I, and I don't know how we, you know, exactly how to work that. I'll think more about it, but I'd really like to see that as part of our, our goal for the community. So, hmm. some of my thoughts on our goals. Can I, can I add something to the climate change? Because um, I don't know if you've seen um, Janet Mills, can, the report that they produced around climate change. Um, it could make sense for uh, taking this with, to draw from that to then help the implementation of the state's climate change plan. So we don't have to create something ourselves. We leverage the work that's that's already been done, and it's a pretty it's a pretty good piece of work at this point in time. Um, and I don't agree with all of it, but I agree with some of it. So. Valerie, thanks for your ideas. I, I want to respond to the climate change one in particular. Um, so I, I wholeheartedly agree with you, and I think there's probably um, fairly broad consensus on the part of most of the counselors um, around the focus and, and need to take action as it relates to um, matters brought on by climate change. What I'd probably divert slightly in opinion on is just how to do that and how we as a community and specifically we as a town council respond to that. Because I think this is, and, and I've maintained for a number of times going through this exercise, that that is one of the utmost areas that is just ripe for a more regional approach versus you know two dozen towns and cities and communities in Southern Maine, for example, all coming up with their own plans and their own goals. And you know, so if our goal is 50% by 2030, but South Portland's is you know, 25% by 2040, well, what good is, you know, I mean, like, th this is something that needs a much more coordinated and cohesive response. I've talked to Troy Moon about it before, because he sits on the board of Eco Main with Matt and I, and um, it's something that he's, you know, very closely involved in, obviously, with the, the One Climate Action Plan that Portland and South Portland have put together. What, what I think makes the most sense is for us to be driving towards solutions on that by joining up to the plan that's already in place and saying, okay, how, how can we just be almost like, you know, like the Paris Accord, how can we be a signatory to that? And how can we then, you know, establish the things that are gonna be implementation steps for us? We don't have either the, the, the resources from a people or budget standpoint to be drawing up our own plans and putting those things into action. But if, if somebody else has already basically done all the work for us, I think it makes all the sense in the world for us to just sign on to that where it makes sense. And, and then begin to execute. So that's just, that's, you know, my opinion on that. And um, I think that if, if we were to do that, you know, number one, it, it's, a, it's a serious step forward from just saying, oh, let's, you know, try and increase recycling rates. Let's think about, you know, installing a solar farm, you know, on a green, on a brownfield um, location, all that kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, sort of, you know, assigns us to a more specific set of action items, I guess, but. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, if I could, yep. if I could go on to that. Uh, uh, yep. Thank you. Uh, it, I'm looking uh, squarely at Councillor Gabrielson and thinking this is something that uh, would be great fodder uh, to bring forward to the Metro Regional Coalition. And I, I know we've had some efforts on this in the past and a couple of items, uh, quite frankly and sadly, most notably is the uh, opioid epidemic that had hit the area as well as uh, the pandemic which swiftly followed unfortunately so it's taken some of those efforts off uh, offline but I think this would be uh, would be something that they could also you know that would be a good vehicle for us to pursue and to be a part of that as well uh, just thinking about uh, other areas because 
you know, as as you say, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, you know, having you know 27 communities trying to do 27 different uh, protocols is difficult. But if we can do that, we can get, gain strength in numbers as well as leverage some of the great uh, assets such as Troy Moon and uh, Julie Rosenbach in South Portland and uh, uh, work with you know because we have other uh, items. Uh, as Councilor Gabrielson had brought up, uh, the Sawyer Road culvert that uh, we've, we've tag teamed with uh, Scarborough on and we'll have to address at some point in time and, the, and hopefully in the, in sooner rather than later because uh, you know it impacts a road that uh, both towns use and uh, replacing that culvert in response to climate change. So uh, it, is, it is something that we're all linked together on, uh, but I think we, that could be a great and successful vehicle to approach that with, especially as we come out of this pandemic and we start working on uh, positive positive approaches. Yeah, and not, not to pile on on that too much. I, I agree with your <laughs> approach and also just, you know, want to make that point that it's not just a, a transportation sustainability, but doing that right is potentially one of our more significant carbon sequestration projects in town if we can get that marsh to start capturing atmospheric carbon again as it should be. Any other thoughts that folks have? Matt, were you taking notes on some of these things? Yes, sir. Okay, I'm good. <laughs> okay, great. Um, go ahead, Jeremy. I was just gonna say, I think the little red dot that says REC is taking notes too. That's my backup plan. <laughs> oh, okay, good. I didn't, I didn't see that we were doing that, sorry. Yeah. Um, it helps it so, to type as furiously. <laughs> so I, I want to make sure it, if any, if, if there are no other, you know, glaring omissions or things um, that folks want to make sure are included, maybe if we want to circle back then around to how to move this forward um, and organize this in a way that we can have a draft to respond to um, and then get just more into the, the editing and um, uh, you know, sort of finalizing mode. Nicole, is that something that you're interested in taking the lead on or yeah, or, and working to. with, working with a couple other people on or? Yeah, I'd have, I would love to work with a couple other people just for like history and knowledge of, um, you know, some of these things that have come in the past, but I'm happy to take the lead on that. So tying back to the first point we were, making with um, how to conduct business and all that kind of stuff, I'd, I'd say if, if there's a plan to, you know, have an actual discussion or meeting about it, um, then let's work through Matt and Deb just to make sure that, um, um, you know, if there's a need to notice it, that it is noticed and, and how to participate that in that and whatnot. If it's going to be you know, one person or multiple people sort of doing independent work streams that then just get fed back in and there's not necessarily a need to. So there are different ways to choreograph and orchestrate that. Um, but if, yeah, if you're I'll questioning- Yeah, I'll take a stab at um, just figuring out how all of this needs to move yeah. and then go to Matt and say, okay, this is what I need to do and help me figure yeah. out how to do it. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, just so just to reemphasize, in, you know, sort of not working it through email and stuff like that um, would be preferred. So, and I'm I'm happy to um, weigh in and 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 uh, participate. I, I I I appreciate the opportunity to not sort of have ownership of it though. So, Penny. Yes, Nicole. If you if you want some help, this is like the type of stuff that I really enjoy so i know it sounds odd but um putting things into framework so that people can understand it so um so, if you want some help just yell when you're ready yeah i'll figure out how things need to move and then like i said talk to matt and figure out like what's okay to ask what's not um the one thing that i'd love if we could maybe do i don't know if we'll have time to do it tonight but if we can come up with like just the brainstorm session of the what that top level should be the town focus areas and like i think some of us said like those can come straight out of the maybe even the mission statement of the comprehensive plan but if we can maybe just 
brainstorm them all out and then choose five or six of them that we feel like should be the priority ones for the coming year. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean the rest aren't important. It just means in the world as it is exists today, these are the top ones. So that would be a great exercise, I think, to go yep. on. And then that will feed what the rest of the things should yep. shake out to be. Sure thing. Anybody want to start off? I'm just trying to pull up the comp plan while I'm... I, I, I have it on my heart, on my desktop. I don't have my comp plan handy. I'm sorry, my brain needs to think about that. Sorry. emailing it to Matt. Oh, it pasted badly. Oh, that's right. I forgot that it's a hundred meg file. Yeah, it's a monster. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, why is this taking so long to open? <laughs> what what about that form um the, the really long page that we had where we were putting our priorities and everything. I was trying to find that. You know what I mean, Matt? Yep, the Maureen spreadsheet. Yes, the Maureen <laughs> spreadsheet. Yeah. I'm trying to uh, navigate uh, on that as well. Uh, let's see. I have a hard copy around here somewhere. Hold on. Maybe not. I thought I did. I think Valerie Adams kind of reworked that. So I was kind of, I was looking to see if it's in an email from Valerie. Okay, uh, I have up here the recommendations. I'm just gonna throw this up if, uh, does this look familiar? Unfortunately. <laughs> so she'll have the uh, economy, transportation, housing, public facilities and services, uh, fiscal capacity and capital investment, natural resources, agriculture and forestry. These and are all the chapters from the actual plan. Uh, yes, they are, and then uh, and then the recommendations for each one, uh, right, as identified under each under each category. Yeah. Um, at, I'm, it, it's almost nearly opened up. I mean, it's really slow to open this file, but in the I know in the front of the plan though, we have sort of the executive summary, and finally it opened oh. up. There we go. Um, there's the executive summary and the vision statement. And I think both of those are, I think, what can be sort of foundational items for what Nicole's talking about for. Um, yeah, I agree. The vision statement says a lot though, <laughs> so. And we, tr we tried to shorten that quite a bit. <laughs> Jeremy remembers, we, we, uh, we tried to call that down. Well, I see it says like with breathtaking coastlines, lighthouses, farms, forests, yeah. and leafy neighborhoods, all in proximity to Portland, Cape Elizabeth will continue to be a desirable place to live. We honor our heritage and history. We strive to encourage citizen engagement, support excellence in our schools, diversify housing choices, create a vibrant town center, 
preserve our open space, farming and natural resources, and connect neighborhoods through a safe pedestrian network. By embracing these ideals, our vision is for Cape Elizabeth to remain a highly desirable and welcoming community. Yeah. So pulling things out of that, I see the, and this is just brainstorming, it's not like the, the end list, mm -hmm. but I see um, citizen engagement, excellence in schools, diverse housing, vibrant town center, preserve open space. And resources and connecting neighborhoods, so safe neighborhoods. I think um, the points that were brought up earlier, I think we had the human services, public welfare, um, could be like the safe neighborhoods piece of things too. I think those might be different. Yeah, I think the safe neighborhoods is more about uh, what I would call walkability or active neighborhoods. Active neighborhoods. So, yeah. Or active communities. So that's a start. Um, there's the sustainability piece we've talked about. Should I scroll up to the executive summary up above as well? Yeah, there might be more in there to pull from. What I'm hoping is that we can maybe get like 20 ideas and narrow them down. That paragraph about issues might be something to draw from because we're getting into more policy related things there too. Yeah. Yep. I think affordable housing is a, a better term than diverse housing because it has a bigger scope. But I think, I mean, just the success of the senior property relief program shows that affordable housing is a piece of things too. Yeah, I think the diverse housing though, to me speaks more to <clears throat> making sure there's different types of yeah. housing for different life stages, right? So yeah. other councils have heard me before talk about, you know, my in-laws in their empty four bedroom house and, you know, making sure that if they want to stay in Cape, that there's a right size place for them to go to. It doesn't necessarily, that need affordability isn't necessarily the primary concern there. It's more just, is there something that fits that need? <clears throat> so I think, I think, I think those are two sides of the same coin. There's one one half of it that has to do with affordability, but one half of it just has to do with diversity of stock. We have the community piece. Um, Well, I feel like there's some other things I like leader in education, natural resource protection, support for farms and local food. I mean, those are, um, I would say if someone who li lives in Cape Elizabeth would come up with those on their own as like, yeah, yeah. that's who we are. We could possibly say housing and transportation so that it sort of covers those two issues, um, whether it's low or moderate income housing or diversity of housing, or if it's transportation issues, um, you might do it broad, like something like that. 
The only thing I'm not pulling from this is um, like the public works and the upkeep side of the town, the like future proofing. So, um, you know, there's not an unnecessary burden on our, our future generations in Cape Elizabeth with aging fire trucks and things like that. Um, We've always referred to that just broadly as infrastructure, whether it's okay. road infrastructure or um, other sort of service infrastructure. But and it even ties into uh, fiscal policy as well on that side, right? To adequately prepare and uh, plan for uh, long-term, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, care and watering of the uh, or feed and watering of the uh, municipal infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Normally when I do this type of exercise, we have, we're in a room together and we have sticky notes that we can write an idea <laughs> on each sticky note and kind of like move them <laughs> around of like, okay, let's keep these, let's put these on the parking lot. Well, that is 13, um, I guess, focus areas for, you know, what is wanted in the town or what are the characteristics of our town and our focus. Are there any that stand out as should be front and center for 2021? Not, remember, this is a living, breathing document. It's not a forever, everyone always has to have this at the top of their list. Um, we've talked about a lot of them already, but if there's any that someone wants to nominate as, yes, this, this needs to be in 2021. I, I would just jump in and say, you know, thinking about where we are as a, a town and as a country, you know, in the short term for 2021, we probably should have a, a, a focus around, you know, both the continuing uh, COVID response to the extent that that we still have some focus and, and work to do on that, um, as well as sort of good solid fiscal management, um, thinking through the economic, you know, mm -hmm. situation we're likely to be dealing with in 2021. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that bucket's called, but I mean, I would probably call it like self and safe and healthy neighborhoods, right? I mean, safe, safe and healthy community of some sort, some some phrasing around that that can be played with because, um, yeah. Yeah, I think it's more. I think it's more effective, effective response to you know the the emergency situation more than the safe and healthy neighborhoods that's still not quite the right name for the bucket but it, it seems like that's going to one way or another that's probably those the combination of those two things is probably going to be eating up a significant chunk of our focus over the next six months can i say something I can't, I, I need to uh, read things, see, can you put what you're looking at on the screen or otherwise I can't participate because I can't wrap my head around um, things that uh, have been said. I am I can't I'm see. similar, I understand if Matt is okay giving me uh, access to share. You're good to go. Okay, let's try this. See if I can blow this up to make it legible because it's small even for me. Um, nope. <laughs> when in doubt, change the font size, right? There we go. Um, okay.
I mean, we know that the schools are um, going to be on here. But I think some of that falls more under the town infrastructure. And we're the biggest challenge will probably be around how do we balance borrowing with uh, the limited pool of, of uh, property taxes. So affordable is affordability, affordable as in oh. housing, okay. I think too that number six would include the um, the fire services. What Penny was talking about earlier. I mean, I think it also is the cell tower, the power um, energies. And those are some big issues that um, a lot of people have been bringing forward. So sustainability is from a, a fiscal perspective or from so what a talking infrastructure about? perspective or from a... Yeah, I... It's such a, it's such a catch-all. It is, yeah. Is it um, from an environmental perspective? And we can put each of those in. Is uh, natural resource protection really encompassed under um, preserving resources, space, farming, and resources? Mm, yeah. That might fit. I guess, Matt, another way to start like thinking about these things is um, what projects are currently in motion, um, like uh, big capital projects. Uh, yeah, you would look at uh, like the solar project, LED mm -hmm. light project conversion for next year, uh, uh, the two probably large, larger items that we'll have. And then uh, there's also- uh, Ongoing sidewalk project. <laughs> yeah. <that's, laughs> Exactly. Uh, we've got the sidewalk segments seven and eight uh, that'll be ongoing. Uh, our stormwater management is also uh, huge in that as well. That's a uh, that's an area that we're always monitoring and trying to manage. It's interesting to look at some of the specific projects too, because you could also take some of those projects and fit them under other goals. You know, looking at the solar and the LED conversion, it, I could see them being part of that that uh, sustainability yeah. climate change response bucket that we were we were talking about earlier. Um, similarly, with the sidewalk projects, you know, I you could just as easily put those under vibrant town center along with uh, acceptance mm -hmm. of town green. Um, sort of where, where to put things up. Yeah, I think that one of the first things we'll do is take all of these things talked about and the current goals and just kind of pull them out as like, okay, what are the common themes? I think the biggest thing we can try and get down to is what are those four or five areas that we should be spending our time in next year? So we know already two of them, right? <laughs> um, I mean, this one could honestly be split out into two in and of itself. Um, 
on number on number eight can rather than say preserve why not say um something around um valuing because if you value it you can take many different strategies and it's not always preservation if you value it you're going to say uh, uh, we value the farms in our community and so therefore we uh, uh, are consumers of their product we value the natural resources therefore we're going to protect them um, that then kind of puts uh, 13 up into that as well you would eliminate 13 yeah. if you change it to yeah. valuing. And then you can also do three, four, right into five, housing and transportation. You don't yep. need affordable housing, diverse housing at all, roll into one housing. Yep. Um, Valerie, you've been the liaison to the, um, so, uh, what did we call it, wind up calling it the Civil Rights Committee. Um, how quickly is that coming back to the council for action and should that where should that fall in terms of like these broad priorities oh i was thinking about that well part of it is citizen engagement and um part of that is going to be our um you know excellent in schools to excellence in schools leaders in education so they're working on that also with schools human services public welfare um but i was looking at number seven and thinking that's really kind of in number four isn't it human services public welfare aren't we talking about schools fire services um but i think you know what what are we really calling it? Um, you know, civil rights. I think it's really about valuing um, diversity. There's there's a focus area for our town is is valuing uh, the diversity uh, in our community, or and and that's just off the top of my head because I think. That's uh, just penny view of the world. I think that what we're trying to get at from a civil rights perspective is um, uh, engaging and understanding. Um, and, and so by creating understanding, we learn to um, value that diversity. So I think that kind of is a standalone thing. I wouldn't want to put it under human services, public welfare, because that's creating an, an image. I think uh, it's about people and... Um... No, I, th I think that's right. And I think that um, that's a good way to say it. And that should probably be highlighted as um, a focus that we're gonna have for this year is the committee will be coming back to us um, very soon with some suggestions and letting us know kind of where they're, where they're at and where they're headed. I think you brought up a good point when you said it, you know, it falls under excellence in schools and citizen engagement too, because I do think citizen engagement is a huge piece of all this. I mean, we need to engage them, you know, to follow executive orders, but, but also, um, you know, these capital projects coming up, we need to engage them and keep like really transparent, open, honest communications with them um, about what it all means. And people are more engaged than ever right now because they can be with the nature of virtual meetings. So I, I do think that that's another big opportunity while we have their attention, how do we retain it for afterward and, um, you know, filler committees and, things like that. Does the vibrant town center, uh, can that integrate in with eight somehow? Uh, because that's one of the things we talk about around creating a vibrant town center is the walkability. 
and um, the connectivity of uh, neighborhoods through trails and those kind of things. So, uh, okay. Well, I think this has quite a bit that I can work with and we can at least get the draft going and you know have something more solid to look at at the next workshop, I guess. Okay. Well, Nicole, thank you for um, volunteering to take that on and, and also for the work already done, like I said, to develop what I think is a good framework for this. So appreciate that. Penny, thanks for all of your input and all the rest of you as well in the, in the meeting discussion here tonight. Um, if there are additional thoughts that you have, if you want to individually, um, you know, send those along by all means. Um, and then we can plan to regroup at our January workshop um, to do more of a, a review and react and, and further editing exercise. So, Penny, do you want to say something? Yes. At January workshop, we were doing the short term rentals, which I think is going to take more than uh, a significant amount of time because we're going to be working on um, words and. Yeah, I'm not opposed to scheduling a second workshop if we need to. Cool. That makes sense. Good, 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 good. So. Yeah. You think we should look at dates in January to do that? It's just pulling up the calendar now. So our existing workshop is on the 5th, is that right? That's on, on the 6th, yeah. yep, it's on the 6th. And then regular council meeting on the 11th. I don't mind um, going back to that. Just so you know that on, uh, it, the, the 6th is not currently on the website calendar. It, 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 it will be. We're, okay. We're, just, we're on it, yeah. sir, yep. <laughs> yeah, okay. And then on the 21st is also that, uh, uh, I think it's the 21st, it needs to be put on there as well. It would be the joint workshop with the, the board. I have the 20th on my calendar, which is a Wednesday. I think that- Is it, is it the 20th? Yeah, uh, I thought it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. The 13th is wide open if, uh, if that would work as well. Sorry, that's what I was just looking at was the 13th. I think that might make the most sense if that works for everybody. For me. I've got the Civil Rights Committee meeting on the 13th. Um, is there any way we could do it on a Tuesday on the 12th maybe? What time is the Civil Rights meeting? Oh, you're on mute. Seven. It's at seven. It's, oh, okay. Um, hold on a second. I think that that would work, but I'm just double checking. Yes, yeah, conservation uh, committee and the school board is on that on the twelfth. But uh, the the beauty of virtual meetings is you don't need a room. Yeah, I think that that would work. Is is the twelfth workable for everybody? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. We'll go with that then. Seven o'clock on the twelfth. All right. Well, thank you guys. I think this was productive. Look forward to the next go around on it.
And um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, Nicole, happy to happy to work with you on this um, if, if you would like. And I'll say thank you to everybody for being open to a, a change to that. I was like, oh my gosh, I should do. Should I send this or not? <laughs> so I just appreciate you for um, listening. Yeah, absolutely. Giving it a try. It's going to be clunky. I'm not promising it's going to work or anything, but I just, I am visual too. I need to see the, what the goals are. Okay. All right. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's it for tonight then. All right. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Be safe. Yeah. All right. Be safe tomorrow. Thanks. Bye.